everyone. Thank you for joining today's episode of Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Environmental Health Nexus podcast, where we talk about environmental health topics. We're joined today by Dr. Neil Muscatello, Director of the Bureau of Environmental and Occupational Epidemiology at the New York State Department of Health. During this episode, We'll be talking about CDC's Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative and how CDC supports their work in preventing climate effects on health using the Building Resilience Against Climate Effects Framework, also known as BRACE. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. As an overview, CDC's Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative is helping grant recipients from 11 jurisdictions use the BRACE Framework. Health officials use BRACE to develop strategies and programs that help communities prepare for the health effects of climate change. BRACE uses a five-step process. Step one is to anticipate climate impacts and assess vulnerabilities. Step two is to make a projection of the disease burden from these impacts and vulnerabilities. Step three is to assess public health interventions that can help reduce this projected disease burden. Step four is to develop and implement a climate and health adaptation plan. And step five is to evaluate the impact of these efforts and make improvements as needed. CDC's Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative funded 18 state and local health departments in 2010 and 11 in 2021. Approximately 57.5 million people are projected to benefit over the course of the five-year grant. Dr. Muscatello, can you tell us what New York State is currently working on as part of this initiative to increase climate resilience and promote positive health outcomes in communities within your jurisdiction? There's certainly a lot going on in New York State, and um, the first thing I'd say is we're certainly appreciative to have the CRSCI funding. Um, It supports a lot of the climate and health adaptation initiatives and activities that we work on. It's really the source of dedicated funding um, at DOH, New York State Department of Health here. Um, Several of these, you know, follow that iterative brace process that you mentioned to assess vulnerabilities and public health risks uh, of climate change and then um, seeking to implement adaptations to reduce those risks. And, you know, we certainly appreciate the um, ability it gives us as well to enhance partnerships, working with others to leverage our resources um, in that climate and health adaptation work. So um, broadly speaking, New York State's currently implementing provisions of what we of what's called the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which I'll refer to as the Climate Act, um, which is New York State's climate law that commits the state to significant actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we're working towards uh, achieving a benchmark of 40% below 1990 levels by 2030 and 85% uh, below 1990 levels by 2050. We've had staff working on the CRS, uh, CRSCI project who have supported that work. Uh, for example, uh, we had the opportunity to provide technical input and data to the Climate Justice Working Group, which was charged with developing criteria um, for identifying disadvantaged communities to ensure that those communities benefit from the state's transition to cleaner, greener sources of energy, reduce pollution, and cleaner air, as well as economic opportunity. Um, we're also working as part of a multi-agent team uh, to develop a a New York State Extreme Heat Action Plan as well as a multi-agency adaptation plan. Um, So as part of this effort, you know, we're using some of that work we've done as part of CRSCI around heat vulnerability and and providing access to cool spaces, for example, uh, in that work. Um, So that's kind of a a broad and, and quick snapshot at the state level. But, you know, we've also really been working to encourage Uh, local level climate and health adaptation action. So to that end, we've been uh, uh, building a great partnership with uh, the New York State Association of County Health Officials. Um, So in concert with the HOUR, the New York State Department of Health Environmental Public Health Tracking Program, working with NYSEJO, uh, we we've been you know trying to encourage local health departments to support climate and health priorities as a part of their work. So this project has provided resources to LHDs 
uh, when I say project, I'm referring to the, the, the BRACE project, um, it has provided resources to LHDs to develop community partnerships for collaborations and address local level uh, climate adaptation priorities. A big piece of that partnership was to implement a series of virtual workshops last fall of 2022 that brought local health department staff and their partners to the table um, to learn more about links between climate and health. Um, so we did these as, as virtual workshops, as I mentioned, and the way we structured them was to hold a couple of opening plenary sessions followed by um, some topic-specific topic workshops. Um, in the plenary sessions, speakers updated participants on implementation of New York's climate law, provided tips on how to communicate about climate change, discussed connections between mental health and climate change, but also highlighted existing resources and programs that could help inform um, local climate and health adaptation work. So this was really a forum for local health departments, their, their local partners, aid agency staff to share climate and health activities, help springboard future collaboration. Um, subsequently, in the topic-specific workshops, we were able to provide time for local health departments and their partners to, you know, meet individually and discuss some of their priorities. Um, I thought it was really interesting to hear the, the work that's already going on. For example, uh, we heard about a pilot project to increase awareness about the Im impacts of climate change on health in a primary care clinic setting that primarily serves vulnerable populations. We heard about another county's experience and lessons learned responding to two 500-year floods within five years. Uh, we heard from another county um, on some of their efforts to integrate climate and health adaptation work in rural communities. So coming out of those, those virtual workshops, um, we're now providing some additional technical assistance uh, in funding a small number of, of projects to support local health department actions in climate and health. And that wouldn't be possible without the CRSCI funding. Um, so examples of some of those efforts will include efforts to promote uh, heat awareness advice to vulnerable populations, increase awareness and education around tick-borne illness, and, and encourage access to local foods. So that's, you know, there's a lot of work going on, but um, those are two um, main projects that are, uh, we're busy with at this time. That's impressive. How has Brace helped your jurisdiction make positive impacts within your community? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I think that Brace framework, which um, is so much a part of this CRSCI funding, has helped us in thinking about where to prioritize our climate and health adaptation work, where we've been able to move forward um, and we've been, you know, we've been able to move forward with that on a variety of fronts. Uh, you know, it's it's rewarding to support work that evaluates health risks and identify vulnerable pop, identifies vulnerable populations, which then leads to the implementation of adaptations. So, for example, a few years ago, um, some of our brace staff's work was also supported uh, by NASA to use remote sensing data and the evaluation of heat health risks. Um, this work you know, showed the impacts of hot weather on New Yorkers for a number of different health outcomes, and subsequently, we partnered with the National Weather Service in using those results to justify the lowering of thresholds at which the National Weather Service issues heat warnings. Um, as another example, we've had a good partnership with the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance as well to promote their uh, Home Energy Assistance Program cooling benefit. So that, pr that program uh, provides a window air conditioning unit to lower income people who may also have medical conditions that could be exacerbated by heat. So as the climate warms, you know, we really feel like this type of program will be important from a health equity perspective to ensure that all people have access to a cool space during hot weather. Um, and we've really worked to promote that program to ensure that the cooling benefit is, is fully util utilized. Uh, and in fact, we have seen demand for the program increase in, in recent years. Um, so it's been rewarding work helping uh, vulnerable populations access those services. Um, I talked earlier about those virtual workshops. We, we, we were really pleased with the turnout of those workshops um, of the 58 counties uh, uh, health departments in New York State, 45 attended at least one, um, and that included 226 individual attendees from local health departments or partner agencies. And, you know, we really recognize that 
local department local health department staff are busy and short staffed and uh, you know especially coming out of covid where there was a lot of uh, attrition so we are delighted that so many people took the time out of their schedule to attend um, and I think we saw that in 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 that we had some momentum coming out of the workshops and um, saw that interest in um, in, in the number of uh, local health departments who participated in that subsequent mini grant program that we're now funding. Um, so again, it's, it's rewarding to help promote climate and health as a public health priority, not only at the state, but at the local and local government and community level. And then, um, you know, again, we're, we're always working to find opportunities to promote what's going on in the area uh -huh. of climate and health in New York state. And um, just recently as part of an ongoing Grand Round series, uh, our Commissioner of Health, Dr. James McDonald, um, moderated a, a session uh, on climate and health. So the audience there was primarily clinical and healthcare providers, but it was an opportunity to discuss the climate law um, and highlight some ongoing work to uh, um, assess climate impacts. We were also able to share some examples of the kinds of efforts we'd like to see in healthcare settings um, and promote awareness about their role in climate change mitigation and climate and health adaptation. What do you consider to be some of the key benefits that come from these efforts supported by CDC? Well, as I've alluded to previously, this programmatic funding, you know, has provided DOH with the resources to do many of the activities I've mentioned. Um, particular, as you've heard previously and in, in, in what I've already mentioned, it supported the expansion of partnerships among a number of agencies and programs that are doing work that intersects with climate and health adaptation. And we wouldn't likely be able to do that um, without this support from CDC. Um, I guess in addition to what I've mentioned earlier, I'd also highlight a partnership we've built with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Climate Smart Communities Program. So that program encourages local health departments to take action around climate mitigation and adaptation um, with special recognition to those that demonstrate con concrete action through a certification process. So, so New York State local government jurisdictions can actually become certified climate smart communities, which means they're taking concrete action towards climate um, mitigation and, and adaptation. And um, some of the actions that communities can take as part of that certification process directly or indirectly intersect with public health. So we've really worked to promote that integration for communities that are interested in climate smart community certification. Um, I'll also mention that it's just, you know, the CDC support has enhanced our ability to partner within DOH, you know, in, in working with other programs internally. So, for example, the workshops we held pulled staff from vector-borne disease and the drinking water programs um, to act as subject matter experts in some of our discussions. We've also worked with our Office of Public Health Practice on several topics, and one I'll mention is um, integrating some of our work into the DOH prevention agenda, which is the, the, the Department of Health's roadmap for public health improvement. Um, so we had the opportunity to include some climate and health-related tracking indicators in the program um, to track progress in that area. And, and as I mentioned, you know, without CRSCI funding, we wouldn't be able to, to do all this work and would be as successful in our, in, in our efforts to integrate climate and health adaptation among other programs. Can you share with us New York State's next steps, priorities, and any short and long-term goals? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, it's really exciting to be part of New York State's overall effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, unfortunately, as we know, even with these significant actions that, that are being taken, we're still going to experience the impacts of climate change into the future. Um, so our priority continues to be focused on um, how the climate impact on public health um, and the steps we should be taking to minimize those health impacts looking into the future. So, in, you know, in the short term, we're going to certainly maintain the, the partnerships that we have. Um, we look forward to continuing to work with the New York State Association of County Health Officials to support climate and health adaptation actions at the local level. Um, we look forward to continuing to fund um, 
local climate adaptation activities and growing that mini grant program. Um, but in addition, we're always seeking opportunities to increase climate and health awareness. Um, and we hope to be able to host some more events featuring subject matter experts in the future. Longer term, um, you know, we're looking to, we've done a lot of work in, in the area of extreme heat, and we want to also be thinking more about other climate impacts like extreme weather and flooding. You know, we know those significant weather events impact New Yorkers um, and our state that can range from um, impacts associated with sea level rise, but also flash flooding in inla inland areas. And so just as we've used this funding support um, to help in moving adaptations around extreme heat or we'd also like to use it to um, support additional adaptation activities around extreme weather. Um, but more generally speaking, I guess I would just say, you know, we want resilient communities that are prepared to protect their most vulnerable populations during extreme heat or extreme weather. So it's important that we consider planning, I think, too, for the possibility of um, additional migration to New York by people from other places who are su suffering severe impacts of climate change. And, you know, that'll certainly require a lot of additional thought and multi-agency approaches. Um, but I think that could be more important in, the, in the, the coming years as well. Thank you, Dr. Muscatello, Director of the Bureau of Environmental and Occupational Epidemiology at New York State Department of Health for joining with us today. And thank you for listening to today's episode of the Environmental Health Nexus podcast. Stay tuned for our upcoming episodes, where we'll continue to dive into all things environmental health.